Now, Washington Mornings on the Mall. At AM 630. 707 on WMAL, the place where Washington comes to talk. Brian Wilson, Brian Neiman. How you doing on this Thursday morning? Pretty good. I'm looking forward to talk to Del Wilbur about this case that uh, continues to continues to grow. It continues to point towards the mayor yeah, as a I possible mean, target. I mean, when you look, if you if you've ever followed cases like this in the past, you have to take with great interest the things that have happened uh, over the past couple of days with uh, associates uh, of Vincent Gray and his campaign. Dell Wilbur with the Washington Post, who's been covering the stories with us now. Dell, sort of lay out what has happened uh, with uh, with two key players in the pre- in the uh, the mayor's campaign. Well, you know, um, back in 2010, the current mayor was then the city council uh, chairman, and he was running against Mayor Adrian Fenty, and he had this obviously pretty aggressive Democratic primary. And he had a bunch of guys on his campaign, you know, high-level, mid-level dudes who um, thought, oh, well, let's try to keep a fringe candidate, uh, Suleiman Brown, who, you know, kind of a wacky guy. Mm -hmm. Let's see if we can keep him in the race to keep pummeling Fenty. Now, the irony is, at this time, I think the poll showed it was either the race was either even or Gray was well ahead, right? So he hires these, these two guys start funneling money orders to Solomon Brown, like in the names of other people from excess campaign cash that they didn't have to, like, report or they should have reported but didn't. And then, you know, Solomon Brown cashed it and kept attacking Fenty, and he even said he got promised a job in the Fenty administration. He gets that $110,000 a year job. I believe he gets canned. And then he comes over and tells the Washington Post in March of 2011, hey, they were paying me off. And the great campaign, oh, we never would have done that. And then Solomon Brown goes, oh, wait a minute, but here are the, here are the money orders and, he, and here are the um, and he, and here are the text and email messages from them. All right, <laughs> here are my phone calls. <laughs> like, and, that, and that starts this federal investigation that's now steamrolled. And just recently we had two guys who uh, have pled, or one is going to plead guilty today, is scheduled for a guilty plea. The other pled guilty this week. And basically that they orchestrated this whole, you know, giving money orders to Solomon Brown. And they appear to be, uh, at least Thomas Gore, appears to be in a situation where he is now cooperating with prosecutors in an attempt to get his, his sentence. He's already pleaded guilty, but he's going to get his sentence hopefully reduced if he if he cooperates with the prosecutors. One assumes that's the same kind of deal that's going to be offered to the second guy uh, today. And wh- what do you read into that? Well, I think I think... If you're a high-ranking official in the great campaign or other other places in uh, city government, you know it kind of spells some trouble if you did something wrong. I mean, that you don't the prosecutors don't give you cooperation agreements like this out in the open in public unless they want to do something with it. They would have wrapped up the case already. And also, let's remember this: at this very same time, the feds are investigating Jeffrey Thompson, who's like a really powerful D.C. contractor who has had billions of dollars in contracts with the D.C. government over the years. They raided his house in March, and, and it's clear that they're probing kind of like these, this flow of do- undocumented money and the flow of money in, in city campaigns and who he's connected to. And he has close ties to the mayor, close ties to a lot of people in his administration, close ties to D.C. council members. And, and they're looking at, at that guy. Meanwhile, the city council president, Kwame Brown, is under federal investigation Jeez. for discrepancies in his 2008 campaign. And so it's like, you know, it's like six of these, like, I, who isn't under investigation might yeah. be the better story. And we wonder why <laughs> the idea Sorry. of self-rule in the District of Columbia doesn't get any traction on Capitol Hill. Well, you know, I mean, let's, you know, a lot of city governments, I don't, I don't think, you know, I mean, it, it seems like, you know, these are obviously huge, huge issues and, you know, corruption and, and things are very important. But uh, if you go to, I think if you went to like a lot of these, a lot of cities in the country, you'd find this or it hadn't been right. uncovered yet. and. You know, I just it, I don't I don't think people in DC. Well, maybe they are, but I don't know if people in DC are unique. To <laughs> corruption. There's a lot of corruption in a lot of different cities. Uh, <laughs> Chicago, Chicago comes to mind first and foremost. <laughs> All right, so are they building the case though? Are they slowly building a case to go after the mayor? I mean, is is yeah. he the ultimate target here? or Do you think it's just people close to him? Uh, you know, it, it it's uh, as, a, as a lawyer told me. You know, what did he what did he know and when did he know it? Mm-hmm. You know, and so. If you also notice what these guys have been dinged on, what these two guys got in trouble for, were not really the underlying crime. Like the Gore, the first guy who pled guilty, admitted he violated three D.C. election law misdemeanors that carry a maximum jail term of six months in prison. However, 
He also pleaded guilty to obstruction of justice, a federal charge of obstruction of justice that carries a 20-year maximum term um, for destroying a notebook ledger Mm -hmm. in which he kept the payoffs. The other guy, who we presume is going to plead guilty today to this charge, um, uh, was charged with making a false statement to an FBI agent. And so, like, the federal nexus almost always in these guys is the cover-up. So, like, they, these people may have done, like, nothing wrong. They may have thought they were okay. They may have even violated some, like, obscure D.C. campaign statute. You know, who knows? Right. right. Or some D.C. campaign finance law. But when you get in with the feds, the, the moment you lie, you're mm. totally toast. Right. right. You know, they're going to string you up. And so, like, you know, I mean, I'm covering the trial of Roger Clemens. You know, that guy... You know, he he lied to Congress. You know, doing steroids for him wasn't a crime, but mm. but you know, I guess I guess technically doing um, you know drugs without a prescription is a crime. But like, I'm sure the statute of limitations had passed. He hadn't done it since 2001. But look at him now. Like, he lies to he allegedly lies to Congress in 2008, and now he's on on trial. You want to talk about a funny uh, trial? As they always like, as they always say, it's not always the crime; it's the cover up that gets you. Yeah. So I just we just you know, there's so many unanswerables. You know, it'd be fun to be. It would be fun to be a fly on the wall in some of these meetings with the prosecutors and FBI agents to see what was really happening. But is there, That's right. is there anything wrong with promising somebody a job in your administration if you win election for, for helping you? I, you know, I think, I think if, like, they're a campaign worker or something, and I think there are laws that bar you from promising jobs in exchange for campaign work, but I... But, you know, I, I don't think that they're ever really enforced, or it has to be such a, a major violation that, like, if you're paying someone, if you give someone illegal payoffs, right. you know, in exchange, and they, for what are you going to give it for me to attack Venti and a job, um, I think there is probably some quid pro quo um, in there. But, like, if you're a dedicated campaign staffer, you know, I think the assumption is you're going to be picked up in the campaign. All right, before we let you go, uh, I mean, Del Wilbur. The administration, sorry. The uh, we're, administration. we're talking with Del Wilbur, Washington Post uh, reporter and also uh, author of the book Raw Hot. We're all high down the uh, near assassination of Ronald Reagan. There was a story out that there was a a vial of blood of Reagan's blood for sale. I know you wrote about that. It, does is there really a, a vial of blood that exists of Ronald Reagan's blood? I know, man. Republicans are just jumping for joy that they can use it to like recreate him. Clone him, yeah. Sometime down the road, right? Him, right? <laughs> well, you know, the assassination attempt occurred in eighty one, and they obviously tested his blood, and it got shipped around and. Some lady at a, a lab in Columbia, Maryland, um, pocketed one of these vials in its paperwork and kept it for 30 years. And now it's on sale on an auction site um, out of the uh, Brit- a British protectorate in <laughs> in the in the English Channel, and they're selling it. And it's, and it's top the bid now. I got it at like 19,000 euros. So, but is it real? Is it thousand dollars? And I don't. Yeah, so it's for sale. It's for real. I asked doctors to look at it who treated him, and they looked at it in the vial. And there are big pictures of it, and they said, yeah, that looks like a legitimate thing. And they're not surprised. I mean, after, you know, I, I interviewed doctors who kept Reagan stitches, nurses who kept reports. Really? You know, they're still hunting. One of his golden bear cufflinks vanished. You know, Reagan had these uh, California golden bear cufflinks that he loved, and one vanished. And the half the report with the FBI uh, that I got for the book, um, half of it is them trying to track down these golden bear cufflinks. <laughs> is so, that right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> and so, like, you know, it's like, you know, you would think they'd do other things. But I guess that was the stuff they didn't have to redact. But anyway, but like, you know, um, so people kept stuff because it was a really, really historic day to them. Sure. I mean, and history kind of glossed over, but to these folks, I mean, geez. And so, like, the Reagan Library and the Reagan Foundation and people who know Reagan went crazy because it's like, you know, what, that's just personal medical privacy. But at the same time, 1981 was a different era uh, with medical privacy. I mean, yes, like, it, was. it just was different. Like, <laughs> doctors could let reporters into rooms with patients, you know, and mm-hmm. you don't do that anymore. Yeah, uh, good stuff. Well, Del, Del Weber, always a pleasure to have you. Please come again. Sure, let's talk Roger Clemens sometime. Yeah, we uh, should. We'd like if to if do we that. can stay awake, <laughs> <laughs> like the jurors. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. All right, All right Del. Good, good observation. Uh,